Hello, and welcome to the lecture for Chapter 2 from the Cosmic Perspective, Ninth Edition. In the second chapter, we're going to talk about discovering the universe for yourself, which is a pretty general title. The main focus of this chapter is the position and motion of planets and moons in the solar system, particularly the ones that are close to Earth. So we're going to be looking at the relative motion of the moon around Earth. So that means, is the moon between the Earth and Sun, for example, or is the moon on the other side of Earth from the Sun? Because those types of questions are the ones that astronomers have been asking themselves for thousands of years and that we still are thinking about today. So this picture here shows the night sky. Now, you wouldn't know it because it kind of looks like daytime, but that's because it was taken on such a long exposure that a lot of light came into the camera, making everything very bright. So it's a long exposure photo. But besides the image being bright, we see these distinctive streaks. Well, the streaks are stars. So, for example, the, the stars started here when the long exposure began, which was obviously many minutes or hours long. And then the star moved along this path. This was a somewhat bright star. We can see examples of brighter stars and their streaks across the sky. This motion represents the apparent motion, or the streaks represent the apparent motion of stars in Earth's sky. I say apparent motion because the stars are not actually moving, at least not at the rate that they apparently are moving through the sky. This apparent motion is because of Earth's rotation around its own axis. That's what makes everything rise in the west over the duration of one night and, excuse me, rise in the east and set in the west. Now, there are exceptions to the rising in the east and setting to the west, but very specifically, those are objects that never rise, but instead stay in the sky over the entire night. Now, this wouldn't be the, earth, the moon or the sun due to their, their proximity to Earth, but this is true of certain stars, stars that lie at the celestial poles, which just means directly above the actual Earth's poles, north or south. Those types of stars that never set are called circumpolar stars. You'd see them as soon as it's dark enough to see them, and they'll stay up the entire night. And if the night's long enough, they'll complete a complete circle, okay? So examples of a circumpolar star are ones right around this area, quite dramatically in the natural rock archway, All right? So ones that are very close to the celestial in this case, North Pole, would include stars like Polaris. Polaris is right near that point, but isn't exactly at the celestial North Pole, so it does complete a very tight circle. We still call it the North Star because it's so close that it's approximately fixed in, fixed in space, but it does complete a really little tight circle. But you know, other stars that are a little bit further out complete larger circles. This is a great example of all the types of motion that we'll be looking at in this chapter. So what are our goals in section one, 2.1? Well, patterns in the night sky. We want to understand what does the universe look like from Earth, such as the picture we're just looking at. Why do stars rise and set? We were just talking about that. It's not because they're actually moving relative to Earth. It's because Earth is rotating on its own axis, causing them to apparently rise and set. Why do the constellations we see depend on the latitude and time of year? Hmm. Okay, so with the naked eye, we can see more than 2,000 stars as well as the Milky Way. So 2,000 bright stars, okay? And the Milky Way composed of many less bright stars that are so packed together that they appear to be a smudge. Now, you can't make out the Milky Way because it is relatively faint unless the night sky is very dark with very little light pollution, all right? But it might look something like this image here. Now, what is a constellation? We maybe know famous constellations like Orion and Polaris and, you know, um, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, but, and the ones that are known with the zodiacs like Pisces and Cancer and so on, but, the, but besides that, those are all official constellations, but that's the, that's the thing. There's an actual official uh, definition of a constellation. Okay, a constellation is the well-known figure, sometimes well-known groupings of stars, okay, that make, that make a shape very loosely. 
draw a picture when you connect the dots, but also the region around those bright stars so that there's no gaps between constellations. That's what this figure shows here. The constellations fit together like blocky puzzle pieces and they completely cover the sky. The purpose of this is so astronomers can, de to, can determine where objects are. Because yes, we can give the, the exact position in the sky in terms of latitude and long longitude in the celestial sphere. We can also give it in terms of you know, position relative to the, um, the local sky in terms of altitude um, as well as declination. But another way of classifying objects in the sky is to say what constellation they're in. Essentially saying what block of the sky they're in. Okay, now it's definitely there's that historical baggage, which is why we still use them and they're such unusual shapes, this, this blocking up of the sky. Otherwise, it might make sense to block up the sky into equally shaped squares, right, that cover the entire celestial sphere. But instead, we use constellations. There are 88 official constellations that cover the entire celestial sphere, both the, the, uh, the north part of the celestial sphere that is well known in North America, for example, but also the, the stars that you can only see in Earth's southern hemisphere those in the southern celestial sphere. So, thought question one. The brightest stars in a constellation are what? A, B, or C? What is it? The brightest stars in a constellation. It's C. They actually might be very far from each other, have nothing in common with each other. They're just the brightest stars that, are, that we see on Earth. Okay, on another planet in another part of the galaxy, they would not necessarily be the brightest stars, nor would they be together, because it's a it's a it's a cluster of stars. It's a big cloud of stars, mostly disc shaped, yes, but but also significantly three dimensional. All the stars that make up the Milky Way that our own sun is one small part of, and so when we look, we're just looking at one little piece of that. 3D cluster, and the stars that appear to be together, as seen from Earth, aren't necessarily together at all. And the ones that are brightest aren't necessarily the closest. They might be just huge bright stars, because stars naturally vary in brightness due to their compositions and initial conditions by a factor of well over a thousand. Some stars are over a thousand times brighter than the sun. All right, so stars at different distances all appear to lie on the celestial sphere. Okay. Now, in, in, in ancient times, philosophers, astronomers thought that the, maybe the celestial sphere was real, was, re, was real, was an actual thing, that we were surrounded by some huge shell. They didn't know. They called it sometimes the firmament and thought of it as almost like a painting, a fixed thing, which was reasonable because the stars didn't move, at least not over the duration of one, a human's lifetime. Now, there is some drift of constellations relative to Earth due to the precession of, of our planet, as well as actual movement of, of, of stars relative to others. But all that movement is, is really imperceptible in one lifetime, and any movement due to parallax, which is an effect of Earth's orbit around the sun, is too small to see with a naked eye, so it would require telescopes, because that would vary over duration of one Earth year, but again, require telescopes, okay? So that's why, for so long, Many people thought maybe the stars really were on a huge sphere. Now, they're not, right? As I said, they form the Milky Way, one of many galaxies. But what is interesting is that we still hold on to this concept. It's still useful to think of the sky as a fixed, almost like glass-like sphere with all the stars being dots on them, as is shown in this picture, with the Earth somewhere you know, inside of it, right? It's a fanciful idea, but it kind of helps us think about what it is we're seeing in the sky. For example, if you're in the northern hemisphere of Earth, you're going to look up and you're going to be able to see stars in the northern hemisphere of the celestial sphere. And especially if you're exactly on the North Pole, right, then you'd exactly be able to see that one half of the celestial sphere. If you're at the equator, for example, then you can actually see the entire celestial sphere. This is a little stick figure. Because over a year, you would spin through the whole celestial sphere, and you'd be able to, at your own horizon, see the north celestial pole, at the other horizon, see the south celestial pole. And over the duration of a whole calendar year, you'd be able to see all the stars. So people on the, or close to or on Earth's equator actually see the most variety of stars in the sky. Okay? Up, up in the northern hemisphere we are, not at the north pole, but in the northern hemisphere, we're seeing some portion of the night sky, but there are certain, and, you, and then this would swing around, which means then we'd, it would cover this many. So we'd be able to see all the stars in this region and this region over the duration of the entire year. 
Some of them in these triangles down here are seasonal constellations that we can't see year round, ones like Orion. The, the ones up top, all right, in this, this region here, all right, this one, <laughs> lots of scribbles here. Well, those we would be able to see year round, but very, very not notably, this whole blank section, we never see, okay? These are constellations that we can't see in North America. All right. So that's kind of a, a that's why, you know, just just this is an example of why still thinking about the celestial sphere is just so helpful for understanding why we see certain stars in the sky. OK, now the 88 official constellations, as I said, completely cover that sphere, that imaginary celestial sphere. Now, on that celestial sphere is an important belt of sorts. Now, there's one a belt, which is the celestial equator, that's directly above Earth's equator. So you can think of it as a projection of Earth's equator. But there's another belt that's tipped to the side, which is called the ecliptic. It's shown here in yellow, all right, little yellow dots. Here it is actually represented as a ring, okay? And that ecliptic, okay, called the basically just called the ecliptic. No one calls it the ecliptic loop or anything like that. They just call it the ecliptic. Well, it represents the sun's apparent path through the sky. These are the locations that the sun takes in the celestial sphere. Because the sun will always be in the celestial sphere, but not the same part of the celestial sphere. Because sometimes the sun is between Earth and some distant, sky, some distant stars in the Milky Way in a certain direction. Half a year later, the sun is between Earth and other distant stars somewhere else in the Milky Way galaxy. Well, those different distant stars make up different constellations. In other words, sometimes constellations are behind the sun. Other times, they're to the other side of the sun. Which type do we see at night? Only the, only the constellations that are on the other side of Earth from the sun. Okay, so that's why the ecliptic represents the sun's apparent motion through the sky. Okay, now, other parts of the celestial um, sphere that I've mentioned, but here let's officially, you know, set them aside, determine them, define them. We've got the north celestial pole, which is directly above Earth's north pole. The south celestial pole, yep, just directly above Earth's south, south pole. And the celestial equator, directly above Earth's equator. So it's a projection of Earth's equator. Okay. Now, the Milky Way sometimes is also shown on the celestial sphere. Back here, um, it was uh, shown up there. You can kind of see it, right, as a, a smudge across a certain part of the celestial sphere. Well, the Milky Way is a band of light, and what it represents is the view looking into the galaxy towards the galaxy center. Because anytime Earth is positioned in such a way that at nighttime in your local sky, you can, you can look in the direction of the center of the galaxy, that's what we see as the Milky Way, because we look towards a part of the galaxy that is so thick with gases and stars that, it, that it's opaque, and it just appears as, as a faint smudge, all right? It's a view into the plane of our galaxy, looking towards the center. We also can have a view, obviously, in the plane of the galaxy, looking towards the edge. That still would, would show up as a smudge, but much less so, because although there's more stars in that direction, it's not, it doesn't have the, the huge concentration of gases as the view towards the center of the Milky Way does. Thought question two. Would we be able to see with our naked eyes another galaxy that lies in the same direction of our Milky Way center? So we're looking in the direction of the center of our galaxy. Can we see another galaxy in that direction? What do you think? A, B, C, or D? Mm -hmm. No, it's because those clouds would completely obscure anything as faint as a galaxy, because the galaxy would have to be on the other side of our galaxy, and we can't look through, as I said, the opaque center of our galaxy. It would block any light from that direction, All right? So that light from that direction is completely obscured to us. Galactic motions take, at the very least, tens of thousands of years, so our orientation of or, or the orientation of our center, our galaxy relative to a whole bunch of other, other galaxies hasn't changed. So that's just a big dark spot. We don't know of any galaxies in that direction, okay? But we have plenty of other directions we can look, such as away from the planes of our galaxy, and then we can actually view a lot of space, all right? Of, the, of distant, distant space, okay? Here is the Milky Way galaxy. Here is our position in the Milky Way galaxy. As I was talking about, the view looking from Earth towards the center of the Milky Way is when we see that distinctive smudge across the sky called the Milky Way, right, in the actual local sky. Now, the views that astronomers use for studying 
the Big Bang, the history of the universe, the evolution of galaxies, the important views for those astronomers is to look away from the plane of the galaxy. All right. That's when we can see other distant galaxies. If we look into the plane of the galaxy, we can see important clusters of stars in our own galaxy, which are very important to astronomy, but we're really not going to see any galaxies in really any direction. Even in this direction, we, we could pick up some galaxies, but the image would be very cluttered by the many, many stars. So astronomy, looking in the plane of the galaxy, great for studying other stars, but if you want to study galaxies, you better look away from the plane of the galaxy. Now, I mentioned the local sky quite a bit. Here's a great image, great figure that shows it, and all the important terms that are related to the local sky. Okay, so an object's altitude above the horizon is measured, you know, just relative to the horizon, okay? So altitude, for example, for this point right here, this point being the sun, would be 60 degrees. So 60 degrees above the horizon, all right? Now the altitude of the zenith straight overhead is 90 degrees because 90 degrees, a quarter of a circle, is going from this point to this point, a quarter of a circle, okay? Now, all right, directly overhead, zenith, another term, meridian. The meridian is an imaginary line that runs from the north to the south. So the direction of north to the direction of south. And it passes through the zenith. Okay? So that's a helpful reference because you can then say where an object such as a star or a planet in the local sky at night is located relative to the meridian. Okay? But you can be a little bit more exact because then you can talk about the direction in the horizontal sense, and that direction would be measured relative to the meridian. So you could say, for example, 60 degrees east of north, okay? And with those two coordinates, an altitude above the horizon, and a direction relative to something like north, well, that gives you an exact position in the sky. It's two coordinates that pinpoint where that object is located. All right, meridian, line passing through the zenith and connecting north and south points on the horizon. The zenith, the point directly overhead, excuse me, the horizon, all points 90 degrees away from the zenith. All right? Now, when we look up into the local sky, one thing we want to think about is how big things are. Now, a good example of that is the size of the sun and the moon. How much of the sky do they take up? Well, it turns out they take up about one half a degree, which is not very much of the, of the sky. Because remember, it's 90 degrees to go from horizon to zenith. And the moon only takes up about one half a degree. In other words, if you were to stack moons one on top of another from the horizon, I guess you're and imagine you're in perfectly flat ground, so there's no mountains or trees obscuring the horizon. So perfectly flat horizon, you could stack 180 moons to go from the horizon straight up to the zenith right above your head. You know, so moon, the moon is actually pretty small, right? A lot of times we focus our eyes on it and it might appear bigger than it is. But when we actually think about how much space it takes up, just a half a degree, all right, across, a half a degree in diameter, okay? Well, in comparison, a, a large constellation like Polaris has a constellation or has a angular size of five degrees, so 10 times larger than the moon. Makes sense. The Southern Cross has an angular size of about six degrees. Now, how do you conceptualize the angular size? Well, a good way to do that is hold your hand away from you at arm's length. Now, people's arms vary in length and people's hands vary in size, but on average, your fingertip is an angular size at that distance, all right, <coughs> excuse me, of one degree or twice as big as the moon. Your entire hand stretched out from finger to finger is about 20 degrees, all right, and if you hold it in the fist, it's about 10 degrees. <coughs> excuse me. Now, as far as angles are concerned, there's the basic idea that a complete circle is 360 degrees. And there's no coincidence that there is about 365 days in the year. That's where the 360 degrees in a circle come from. All right. So, you know, early astronomers didn't know exactly how many days there were in a year. And so the approximate was 360. Okay. But what astronomers do, as well as people who measure latitude and longitude on the surface of Earth, is they get more precise than just degrees. They split degrees into smaller pieces, but they don't split the degrees into smaller pieces in the same way that we split numbers into smaller pieces, which are tenths and hundredths. Instead, they use the convention that we use with time, 
which I guess is appropriate because after all, there's 365 days in a year. And then, you know, how do we split a, be- a day up? Well, we don't split it into hundredths. We split it into hours and there's 24 of those. So that's kind of a weird exception. But then remember hours themselves. Well, hours we split into minutes, of course. Well, there's 60 minutes in an hour. Ah, so that's what we're going to use in astronomy. We'll split things into 60ths. Every degree can get split into 60 smaller pieces, which are called, appropriately, arc minutes. All right? So arc minutes are 1 60th, or one arc minute is 1 60th of a degree. All right? So not a hundredth, but a 60th. Then we can split arc minutes into arc seconds. There are 60 arc seconds in one arc minute or each arc second is 1 60th of an arc minute, okay? Well, notice also the notation. We use, like we do for feet and inches, a single accent mark for arc minutes and two accent marks, like a quotation, for arc seconds, all right? So notation like feet and inches, but splitting up into 60ths like hours and minutes, all right, as the names imply. Here's a question for you. How many arc seconds are there in one degree? Well, here it is. What's the answer? How many arc seconds are there in one degree? Okay, remember there's 60 arc minutes in one degree, but I'm asking how many arc seconds there are in one degree. Well, it's 60 times 60, which is 3,600 or 3,600. There are 3,600 arc seconds in one degree. Okay, so this angular size is related to physical size with the following formula, all right? So we see then that the angular size equals the physical size, all right, times 360 degrees divided by two pi times the distance, okay? So there's kind of a some, some strangeness there in terms of the slide. Not sure why. I haven't seen this uh, this come up before. I'll uh, take a look at it. But the for- complete formula here is angular size is physical size times 360 over 2 pi times the distance. Okay? The 360 over 2 pi has to do with the way we're calculating angular size and in radians, but then converting it back to degrees so we can use things like degrees with arc minutes and arc seconds. So, so it's a conversion of sorts, but it's a very helpful way of if you know, say, the distance to something, then you can relate its angular size to its phys- physical size. So you, if you look at how much space it takes up in the, lo- in the local sky, you know how big it is really. But it's important to remember that that only works if you do know the distance. So so much of astronomy is then being able to determine that, that distance, all right? Because if you know the distance, then very importantly, you can find the physical size. All right, true or false? The Earth and the Moon are both ex- are are both extended or both extend approximately half a degree in our sky. This means they are both at the same physical size. Think what you think what you know about in very rare events in the sky that people get excited about eclipses. It's true. All right, they both take up about half a degree. They are both approximately the same angular size. Oh, but it says false. Oh, because I misread it. See what I did there? So it wasn't saying that they're both approximately the same angular size, although that's what I read to myself, right? It, it says physical size. Ah, well, there you go. They're not both the same physical size, although the, it is true, okay? It is a fact that they are both the same angular size. They do both have, it is true, that they both extend approximately one half a degree, okay? But here's the thing, right? Here is, say, Earth, and here's the moon, all right? The moon is close, so this angular size is about half a degree. Now we have Earth, and then really far away, we've got the sun, okay? The sun is much larger, but when we make this much larger cone, well, we still get half a degree. Okay, so that's the idea. Much larger sun, but much further away. In fact, the distance, the distances are about 400,000 kilometers. And then the distance from Earth to the sun is 150 million kilometers.
kilometers. So big difference there in terms of the distances. And also very big dis uh, difference in the actual physical sizes. All right, same angular size for the sun and the moon, which is why we can have something like a total eclipse, but very different physical size. Okay, so stars rising and setting. This is like the opening image from this, um, these, uh, this, this lecture from, this, from these slides. If you are standing on the North Pole, right, so for a stick figure up here, then all stars in the sky would be circumpolar. There'd be some that will ride right along the horizon, okay, so that you maybe wouldn't be able to see them clearly. But all stars you could clearly see in the sky would be circumpolar. None of them would rise and set because they'd all swirl around you because this that motion is apparent. It's completely determined because of Earth's rotation around its own axis, right? There's an axis right through the, through the physical Earth, and Earth spins around that axis, all right? That's what creates the rising and setting of stars, all right? So our view from Earth is has to be understood by thinking about Earth's motion, all right? So let's consider a person up here in North America. Their local sky has a zenith, which is directly overhead for them, and it's got some horizons, okay? Those horizons lie at certain points at a certain time of the night on the celestial sphere. Some stars, like this one shown here, are circumpolar. It might get cl very close to the horizon, but it never actually sets. Other stars will very clearly rise in the east and set in the west because they're not circumpolar. Their relative motion takes them around to the other side of the planet, okay? That's after they've set from the perspective of our figure in the northern hemisphere, in North America. Other stars we would never see, as I talked about because they never pass into the part of the sky that we can see at night, all right? So, what thought question four, what is the arrow pointing to in this photo? What is that point right there in the center of the tightest circles of circumpolar stars? Is it the zenith, the north celestial pole, or the celestial equator, all right? It's the north celestial pole. It's definitely not the zenith because it's not right overhead as we can clearly see in the photo. It's actually near the horizon, but it is the north celestial pole, all right? Now, it could also be the south celestial pole if you didn't know, you know where this photo was taken and you didn't know the significance of the fact that there is a bright star very close to it. In the southern hemisphere, there's there's no bright star that close to the celestial pole. So, this, and you know, so, yeah. And maybe you could say, oh, well, you know, I know that this this particular rock formation is in some state in North America. I'm not sure where it is. but then you know that that kind of information could tell you it's the north celestial pole, but you might not know. But again, an option of the south celestial pole was not given, so important. Another thought question: Thought question five. Not knowing how stars appear to move in our sky, how would gal how would galaxies? Oh, sorry, not not. Blah, blah, blah. It says now knowing how stars appear to move in our sky, as we were just talking about. How would galaxies move in our sky? All right? What's the best answer? A, B, or C? Mm -hmm. They would not move. It's B. They are also on the celestial sphere. There's really no difference. Now, it, you know, it's the same idea, right? They 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 appear basically fixed in space. Their rel their actual physical motion relative to us is, you know, although they may be great speeds, they're so far away. They they remain at the same location relative to other objects around them. But every day they rise in the east and set in the west. All right, because of Earth's rotation on its own axis. However, there are actually no galaxies you can see with the naked eye. The closest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, has a large angular size. It has an angular size of about three degrees, so six times larger than the moon. So, wow, shouldn't that be obvious? But it's really faint. Think of it as a very, very faint smudge, a large one, but a faint smudge. You just simply, this this that's not bright enough to make out with the naked eye. But with a telescope and a longer exposure, or just a telescope that lets a lot of light in, is you can see it pretty clearly. All right, so why do the constellations we see depend on latitude and time of year? Well, they depend on the latitude because your position on Earth determines which constellations remain below the horizon, right? And which stars are circumpolar, okay? So this first bullet point is referring to this, this uh, figure back here, this one, okay? But what about the time of the year? Well, they depend on the time of the year because Earth's orbit changes the apparent location of the sun. 
Well, that's the thing. We can never see stars that are in the direction of the sun because they're washed out by the light of the sun because it's daytime when we're facing in that direction. So we don't see stars in that direction. We have to wait half a year for to be pointing at night in that direction. Okay? Can you kind of visualize that? Well, we'll, we'll show it in the figure in a minute. Okay. So review coordinates on the Earth, an idea that you probably have heard before. Well, there's two terms, latitude and longitude. Latitude is the position north or south of, the, south of the equator, and the longitude is the position east or west of the prime meridian, which an ar is just an arbitrary chosen point, whereas the equator is not arbitrary because it's between the poles. Well, the meridian connects the poles, so where do you decide to draw it, draw it? Well, historically, it was chosen to pass through Greenwich, England. Okay? Shown in this figure, we can see the equator, right? running at a latitude of zero, and we can see the prime meridian running at a longitude of zero. Okay, well, we can do the same thing with the celestial sphere. There's an equator, there are poles, therefore there's going to be latitude and longitude in the celestial sphere. All right? And the altitude of the celestial pole equals your longitude. Okay, pretty neat idea. How can you be confident? Well, think about what's going on here, right? If you are at, say, the North Pole, well, in that case, the North Celestial Pole exactly matches up with your zenith. Okay, so then that's saying that the altitude of the Celestial Pole, if again, if you're standing at the North Pole, the altitude would be 90 degrees because it's at your zenith. Well, then that should equal your physical latitude. Well, it does. Because the latitude of the North Pole is none other than 90 degrees. Aha, uh -huh, so it works, all right? But you can do it at any other point. For example, you can even do it in the Southern Hemisphere. So if, you're, if you find that up, all right, is 34 degrees, all right, then that means that your latitude is 34 degrees, in this case, South. Okay, thought question six. The North Star, Polaris, is 50 degrees above your horizon, due north. Where are you? Well, remember the rule. Okay, which one is it? A, B, C, D, or E? You're 50 degrees latitude north. All right, so you're somewhere in the northern hemisphere at 50 degrees. I think that's like Canada or something. Okay? Okay, so finally, the sky varying over one Earth year. Okay, this is an idea I've mentioned a lot, and this is that really good figure that shows it. So as the Earth orbits the sun, the sun appears to move eastward along the ecliptic, okay? So I'm not saying that the sun moves in a duration of one day because the sun's always going to rise in the east and set in the west due to Earth's rotation on its own axis, right? But over many days, there is a, there's a, a trend, okay? So we find that the Earth moves eastward along the ecliptic. So the position of the sun at the same time of day is more east each subsequent day, okay? At midnight, the stars on our meridian are opposite the sun in the sky, okay? So let's zoom in here. So let's think about a date in the summer, August 21st. On that particular date, at night, you would look up and you'd be able to see constellations like Pisces, Aquarius, and Capricornus. Now, Aquarius, in particular, would be right overhead, all right? it would be visible at midnight right overhead, okay? Well, let's think about that. What about on that same day, August 21st, at noon? Well, at noon, your view would be right towards the sun. So all you're seeing is the sun. It's right overhead. You're definitely not seeing any stars. The one notable exception is if there happens to be a total eclipse of the sun happening on that day, then all of a sudden the, the, the sky darkens and you would, for a few minutes, be able to see stars but that's a very, very rare exception. Most of the time, the sky is dominated by the incredibly bright sun, right? Many, many millions of times brighter than the light coming from stars. Well, that means that you can't see anything in the direction of the sun, which means that Leo, Cancer, and Virgo would be completely obscured. You simply can't see them in August, okay? No matter where you are, all right? But now, in this case, these, are, these might be northern hemisphere constellations, so you might not be able to see them anyway in the southern hemisphere but if these are constellations that are visible at many latitudes those that are kind of right along the celestial equator 
then in that case, this would be something that would hold true for both the North and the South, okay? Because this is, this is a yearly event, okay? Now, of course, if we let six months go by and we go over to February 21st, well, the opposite is true. Now we can't see Aquarius, Pisces, or Capricornus because they'd only be visible at noon. And right at midnight, Leo is overhead, and we'd also clearly be able to see Cancer and Virgo, right, during the night. Okay, so hopefully that explains why different stars are visible at different times of the year. So let's summarize what we've learned in this first section. We can see over 2,000 stars and the Milky Way with our naked eyes, and each position on the sky belongs to one of the 88 constellations. We can specify the position of an object in the local sky by its altitude above the horizon and its direction along the horizon. That's a coordinate, tells us where it is. Why do stars rise and set? Well, I think we've definitely established it's because of Earth's rotation. It's apparent motion, okay, as opposed to real motion. Why do the constellations we see depend on latitude and time of year? Well, your location determines which constellations are hidden by Earth, right? Is which ones are circumpolar and so on. And the time of the year, as we were just talking about, determines the location of the sun on the celestial sphere and which stars are obscured by the sun. All right, so we're going to go ahead and finish this video here because it's been going for a while. And I'll pick up with another video for this chapter for section 2.2, where we'll talk about the tilt of the planet, which is the reason for the seasons. All right, well, thank you so much for watching.